Hi, I'm Jonathan Sugarford Moffitt, and you listen to my interview with Elaine Goodman on gogoodman.com.au. Enjoy. I know people that have been to New Orleans and they talk about the music culture on Bourbon Street and the different bars to eat and drink, and it sounds very entertaining. And you grew up, you were born in New Orleans. Was that the vibe when you were growing up? Absolutely. It was a very, very, um, I should say, very, very lucrative uh, music scene there, meaning um, the degree of bands and artists, it was so plentiful. Every neighborhood uh, in this different, call, they call wards, parts of the city was divided off into what they call art, W-A-R-D-S, wards. And um, I was from the seventh ward, but each ward had like five, six, maybe eight bands and artists that, around, and we all used to buy for uh, vie for clubs uh, that was in the city to try to be the band and get that club, the most popular club. So it was very, very uh, positive and lucrative and, and energetic back then when I was growing up. It was, it was very plentiful, but now it's not so much. In interviews I've heard, you talk about picking the, picking the drums because your two older brothers picked guitar when your dad got you into playing music. Did drummers get a lot of attention back then? Were, were, were drummers cool and were they seen as part of the band? Drums is like the main seat, mainstay, the most uh, um, important um, part of the, the music scene now. There's a rhythm of drums. I know hard horns are, are as well, um, even more than guitars and basses. But drums and horns and piano was the three main interest, in, instruments that uh, garnered the most attention. And because New Orleans music is so rhythmic and piano patterns are so rhythmic in New Orleans, where they play rhythm, rhythmically. And uh, um, so in horns, uh, uh, a real jazz uh, melody oriented, and drums are like Caribbean and, and Afro uh, Cuban rhythms, you know, so, and uh, sync a lot of syncopation. So, yeah, drums was very, very prominent in the music of New Orleans back then, as, as well as now, you know, uh, the rhythms of drums is, is uh, the thread that weaves it all together. I've listened to a couple of previous interviews you've done, and there was a moment where you talked about the support of your brothers. You were surprised about getting paid when they paid you. They helped you pack up and unpack your drum set after each show. Is that kind of sibling support rare in the industry, and are you still close with them today? Um, well, uh, to, start off, to start off, a very, very unfortunately, both of my brothers have passed away. One passed in 1999 at only 49 years old, and the other passed in 2012, and he was only 59 years old. Unfortunately, I lost both my brothers. But they were very, very supportive of me. They were proud of me, like much like the Jackson brothers were proud of Michael, little Michael, doing being so talented at his age and, and doing so well and, and, and so gifted in the maturity of his, his craft and singing. You know, for a person his age, he sang like an older man who had a lot of love experiences and knew how to relate it to the public and to the audience and to his, his voice and his emotion and passion. He sounded like he had a lot of relationships and got his heart broken many times. And, and then he was really actually only eight, nine, ten years old. So um, I had a sim- similar kind of thing with my playing. It was for, they, they tell me it was advanced for my age, much advanced. So I was able to play uh, songs and clubs at ten years old and get paid. But my brothers, I was shocked and surprised because I did it for the love of it. And I never imagined that we were going to make money at the time. And they gave me money. And I was like, what is this for? And I'm pulling on it. Wow, this is great. They said, what is this for? They said, yeah, you get paid for doing these show, these clubs. And that's what I was like, wow, you know, like a little kid would do in amazement. So uh, they would help me out and tear my drums down, help me load it in the car. And, and uh, they took care of me. My mother and father said, as long as they took care of you and made sure you didn't go by the bar and get into drinking. And, and it sounds funny, but they said, my, my parents said, as long as you keep the ladies away from him, they were teasing, but I'm um, 10 years old, of course, but they were teasing, but they told him, take care of him and watch him with the older people around there. So my brothers, they, they were only like a year and a half each older than one another. And uh, not that they were so old, but uh, or much older than me, but they still were older and they were the guardians of me, much like Jackie was for Michael and the Jackson Five. Something I found really interesting in interviews I've heard was you talking about your reluctance to move out of home. You see actors and musicians today are buying multi-million dollar mansions at like 18 or 20 years old. There seems to be a necessity to live independently. Why Why were you so reluctant? <clears throat> well, you're talking about a whole different era of um, of society and, and, and the way people had, were and the way... Um, 
kid's thought. Uh, I don't know what it's from, you know, maybe movies or uh, uh, just a spirituality because every generation seems to be at more advanced than the next, I mean, than, than the last. Maybe that, but back when I was growing up, we were, uh, families were attached, very, very attached, especially the children to their parents. And it was hard to leave home because you love your parents so much. You're so used to your life around your parents and your family and your the family home. And uh, it's difficult, you know. And and anything outside the borders of the city of New Orleans, and especially anything outside the borders of the, the state of Louisiana, it seemed like foreign tel- territory, which it was. But it almost seemed like you walk across that border and you, you're stepping into space, <laughs> out, of, out in the outer <laughs> rim of the space atmosphere. You're scared you know, of the unknown. And uh, that was the mentality because we were so used to being sheltered around our parents and our lives in that one circle of, of New Orleans and of the neighborhood that we were in. We were just more naive and more innocent back then and uh, um, more timid, and I would say. Um, so we, we gravitated more to staying in town and, uh, and not leaving town, but I realized that after I played on Bourbon Street for about a year, and it wasn't like I saw on television, <laughs> the greatness of, of the artists and the bands and the stars on television, I say, man, this is not what I thought. You know, I say, I want to be higher like the, the people on television, the Beatles and the Stones and, and all the groups on the top, James Brown. How, how do you reach that level? And then I realized that it's not here in New Orleans. And somebody said, you got to go to Los Angeles. You know, that's where it is in Hollywood. And I thought, setting my mind on that, Finally, it took me years and years to get enough nerve to go and I'll come out here to Los Angeles, where I am now. Uh, but I did eventually in 79. And um, about a month and a half after I stepped out on that limb of faith and uh, taking a leap of faith and that um, it'll be okay, I, I stepped out a month. And a month and a half later, after I moved to Los Angeles, I got an audition for the Jacksons, and everything came from that. You know, it, it goes to show you that uh, if you take a chance, you know, and you believe in yourself enough, and you trust in God, you trust in, in destiny, and you feel that calling of destiny, you got to go for it. You got to step out on the limb of, of faith and, and belief and and, um, and trust that you it'll be okay if I give it a chance. It could happen. And that, and it was my test. It was a testimony. My life is such a testimony that if you do so, it can happen for you. Because a month later, a month and a half later, I was with the Jacksons, and and my professional career had begun. So how old how old was Michael when you first met him? He would have been about sixteen or seventeen, yeah. When I joined the Jacksons, I was twenty four, and I got the audition and joined them. And Michael was twenty; he's like four four and a half years younger than me. Right. So did he have? Did you feel that he had any of that kind of nerves of moving moving away and moving to the big city that you had? Or was he was he already or was he already set to go? Like he was already in the industry. Oh, he was absolutely a long time before already in the industry. And when I was in, still in New Orleans and grooming my, myself for stardom, um, Michael was a star and had been all over the world. And you know, even they they got discovered and were their first songs and television shows was in '68, '69. I didn't move to uh, Los Angeles and Hollywood till '79. So they they have been stars since '68. So. Uh, uh, Ed Sullivan show, and they had done a lot of things, you know, in New York and Apollo, and in you know, Chicago and in um, Gary and Indiana and other places, you know, on stage with some big stars already, you know, before they did the Ed Sullivan, Sullivan show and recorded their first hit. So they were long uh, before me established in Hollywood and um, the circles of, of stardom, and uh, I started, you know, much much later. Now, I've, I've heard you say, and we, we know that your first big job was with the Jackson 5, as you just mentioned, and you built this chemistry with Michael Jackson that not even Michael could un- could understand. You knew what moves he was going to do and what sounds or beats you needed to make. Was that chemistry ever scripted, or was it just a matter of something clicking between you two? <clears throat> That's the thing about it. It was so such magic. We never really, before we met after, he wasn't at the auditions, but... After when we got started the first rehearsals, we never had met, of course, and, and hadn't worked together, done anything. And it's just that we only, and my first professional show with them was, uh, we, we had three days to rehearse. I had three days to learn the first tour with them, the entire show, three days, and then we left for town. So it wasn't like we had a lot of time for me to get acclimated to his moves and to everything. And so when we did the first show, that's when he told me, he said, 
like it's like you're reading we're reading my mind how did you know i was going to do this and you hit this beat you hit this accent how did you know i was going to spin and stop when how did you know when i was going to stop spinning and and hit the accent and i tell him i don't know i could just feel you i'm watching you and i can feel it when you're going to happen it's going to happen it was, you got, i love it i love it keep doing that no one's ever done that with me before and it was became a magic thing for us you know that um it was automatic you know it wasn't something that we worked on it was um it was an intuitive thing, connection that he and I had. So more, more so me to him, because he didn't watch me. I watched him, and I had to react to his action. And it's sort of like in a movie, in a film, where you have the Foley artist that, that when they, during the final production doing the Foley sound effects for the, the actions of the actors in the film. I'm sort of the Foley artist for Michael and his actions on stage to make them more dynamic and seem and look and feel more dynamic. I do the right hits and accents and breaks and, and different creative things that, to his moves, and, and that's instantaneously, that makes him seem dy more dynamic and powerful on stage. And that's my job I already I took on from the very beginning. Now, Michael Jackson, in my mind, was one, one of these uber celebrities, the kind of people that when whenever they're in public, they're always somewhat performing or they're most comfortable on stage and if they're in public, maybe they're, they're a little bit shyer. People like Johnny Carson, Rodney Dangerfield, Lady Gaga, they tend to or tended to to be shy in terms of fan interaction or doing media. Is that how you saw Michael, just this amazing superstar on stage, but when he, when he got off stage, he was a little bit more reserved? Oh, he was very much more reserved. He was a, it was really ironic because he was so powerful and dynamic on stage and the commanding the audience and the audience's attention and our attention of being in the band and uh, for commanding everything aspect of the show. And then when he gets off stage, he was this the most shy and humble and, and timid person you could ever want to meet, you know, um, shyly smiling and laughing and uncomfortably so. You could tell and you could feel it and watch his face and mannerism, the nervousness within him when he was around people and he looked at you and he tried to look at you strong, but you could tell the undercurrent of nervousness and timidness within his spirit. So, um, you know, I got used to that. And, and, uh, I mean, and we, us being around the same age, I was that way to a great degree too, but I wasn't that way in other, in other aspects of things. I was a little, a little bit stronger because I grew up in the streets in New Orleans. I, even though I had a more sh uh, uh, reserved life, I was in a middle class family and middle class neighborhood, more reserved life, not a real tough life, but still, I was amongst people in society out in the open. And I, um, even though I was shy and quiet, um, I was used to being around the toughness of life in the world. Michael never got to experience that because he was the golden goose that laid the golden eggs for the family and for the, uh, the, record, the record company, Motown. And they all counted on him, and they kept him sheltered behind the gates and, and amongst the family not to go out on his own uh, and venture out on his own So because they didn't want nothing to happen to him. So uh, he didn't experience the, the street life and getting to, to become mature amongst the, the toughness of the world. So that, therefore, he was it was like scary to him and shy and, and new to him, um, foreign to him, I should say. And uh, as you can feel that when you're around him. So was was that kind of personality shift something you tried to define early in your partnership with him, or was that something you, you you just got used to because that was Michael? We both identified with one another because we were both that way. I wasn't to the degree that he was. I was very very quiet back then. And shy, and I mean, since I was a little boy, my mother always said we couldn't find you in the house a lot of times because we kept calling for you and answer, and you'd be in the closet with clothes over you, like show, uh, and, and behind the clothes, and playing with your men, fighting men, or some kind of space thing in your mind, and you were so quiet and shy, and we'd, you'd be in another room, we'd be looking all over for you, but you wouldn't answer. I would be in my own world, and I wouldn't talk, and she said you wouldn't talk too much. He was always quiet and introvert, and so I was. It just happened to be that he and I were very much alike. He was, to, I would say, to the extreme. And uh, I want to, you know, by my, my growing teenage years, going to being around my friends out in the neighborhoods on the corners and talking and clowning around, I got a little bit more open but still quiet because I was of the nature that you can't learn while you're, when you're talking. You learn when you're listening. So um, I was always listening to the people around me, no matter who they may be, you know, my rough friends or my, like, my people like friends like me, and I would just be around them. I just never was around troublemakers. As soon as I see something that's going to be trouble, I'd leave because I was very shy and timid and 
it's a little scary, but because I wasn't it, didn't want to get in trouble. I had this thing about respect of the law, respect of of, of a positive of society. I never wanted to be in trouble. So as soon as I see things getting foul, I would always leave and and, and, and just just sneak out of the situation and go home. <laughs> and so Michael was uh, he never experienced those things I did as far as the natural life. And uh, but I know we recognize that element in, in us. Like I said, I was a little bit more out there than he. But he saw it in me, and he felt it in me when I speak softly, and when I wouldn't talk as much, I would uh, be more quiet and reserved. And he, those are the, the aspects of his character and personality as well. And we recognized one another for those traits, and we gravitated toward one another. Not that we hung out with each other all the time. We, um, I was more respectful at that time, so I didn't try to be under him all the time or with the Jacksons, and because uh, I was told that. You know, they shy away from people that try to smother them. So I never really try to call him up and go over, uh, uh, hang out with him, even though he invited me. You know, I just gave, gave them their space because I figured everybody else in the world and everybody else in their world around them trying to take up some of their time. So if I was another person, just another person taking up their time, when will they have family time just for themselves? So I would start considerate in, of, of those situations, those aspects of relationships. So I wouldn't. I didn't want to infringe upon their family time, so I wouldn't call them. I wouldn't. I mean, go and see them, see them, and hang out. I was, you know, only when they needed me for work, I'd be available, of course. So, but I respected their time. I didn't try to show up at the house, even though they invited me all the time and hang with them. And I didn't want them to think I was trying to get something and gain something from them. Because if you hang around a lot, a lot around people, a lot of people do that, and they try to get them to either give them some money or buy them something just because they round and feel like family. I didn't want them to have that impression of me, so I purposely pushed back and stayed away a bit so they wouldn't get that impression of me. And they've always spoke of it, too. They, they say, but you never ask us for anything. You've been so great with us, you know. You, you know, we, we love that about you, and you're respectful, you know. Um, it really treated us right, and you were, um, you, you, we liked having you around, but, you know, you never really bothered us about anything or uh, wanted anything from us. And everybody, everybody else wanted something from us and tried to get something out of us, and you did. And we love you and for it, and we respect you for that. You played with Michael Jackson and Madonna, but you, you never played with Prince, which I've heard you say you kind of you kind of wanted to play with Prince. And you've played with a ton of other artists, including Elton John, Janet Jackson, Lionel Richie, George, and George Michael. How did you balance loyalty with self progression as an artist and playing with playing in different genres, playing with different artists? Well, that's that's interesting because that was it was worked out most of the time, but sometimes there were clashes and conflicts. Uh, but as far as me playing with Prince, I've never played with Prince before. And he asked me to jam with him because he would be at a lot of shows that I worked with. I worked on being a lot of Jackson concerts. And then he been with that Elton John show with the fun group Cameo that I, I work with. And he came to Madonna. He seen me with a lot of people. And he said, I want to, I love to jam with you. You got to come to Minneapolis. So you're, you're, that was incredible. He would seen me several times on several different artists and concerts I've done. But we never got a chance to now. Uh, indirectly, we worked together on, my, on Madonna's "Like a Prayer" album. That's him playing guitar in the intro of the of the song "Like a Prayer," and I played drums on that album, that record, as well as the album, about six or seven songs of the album. So in, indirectly, we we weren't in the studio together, but indirectly, we worked played together on the same hit or song. Um, so I would love to have played with him, and I never got the chance. But my my little brother, I call him John Blackwell, bless his soul. He passed away last year on yesterday, the 4th of July. Um, uh, anyway, he was a drummer, and there was no way on heaven or earth I would try to you know, get that job because I don't do that, Take people try, try to take people's job. Um, but as far as the conflict's concerned, most times it worked out in scheduling because of breaks between artists and their, their tours and everything. But there's times like on the Bad Tour, Michael's Bad Tour, I was set to be mu musical director and do his tour. And then he pushed it back 10 months. Madonna called me for the second tour, the Who's That Girl tour. And Madonna and Michael pushed his tour back 10 months. So I called his manager, Frank DeLeo, and asked him, um, you know, what they're going to do and would they retain me for the 10 months if I pass Madonna up? And they said, well, no, go make the money, and um, we don't want to stop you from making money. You'll be ready in that 10 months, and we'll call you. It just so happens Madonna extended her tour two weeks. I was under contract, and I couldn't leave. And she extended two weeks. And Michael sent his team to come get me. Me and David Williams, his guitarist, 
from Madonna. We both were with Madonna as well. So, um, so, but we couldn't leave because we were under contract, a legal contract. So, uh, Michael had to get Ricky Lawson. That's how Ricky Lawson got in there. And Michael wasn't very happy about it that me and David couldn't come or didn't come. So it was an awkward, awkward situation. But Ricky wound up doing a bad tour. But I have the contracts, the original contract. It was just me and Michael on the contract. And then we, would, he liked the way I put together Jermaine, his brother's band, in '86. And so he what hired me was hiring me to be his music director to put his band together. So he was very upset with me that I wasn't there and I couldn't get out the Madonna contract to help him put his band together like I did Jermaine's band. He liked the band so much. He came to our show and said how much he was surprised that I had put the band together. I was a music director, and he liked the band so much and said it was the best sounding band he, that Jackson's ever had. And he wanted me to do the same for him, and I couldn't because I was under contract. So that's one conflict. Another was in uh, with his own sister Janet. Uh, when they called me about the Dangerous tour, Janet had gotten me for her Janet tour in '93, '94, or had secured me right before. And I had already promised that I'd be do her tour. Michael wanted me to do his his uh, dangerous tour, but Janet said no. I got you now, and so I couldn't get out of that one. So that was another time of conflict where it crossed up like that. And uh, then I got wound up getting back with Michael on the history tour, and did his history tour, the 30th anniversary special, and then I was rehearsing with him for This Is It. So did you ever feel there was like a possessive culture? over you and, and over your abilities or did you always kind of feel like you had the final say obviously you couldn't have the final say because you're under contract but did you feel like there was kind of bad blood between the artists that were trying to get you onto their side absolutely i did it was very uncomfortable because i loved love love them all i didn't know who to, to offend i didn't want to offend anyone any one of them and i wanted to be loyal to all of them but you know, what say what helped me was that I had, when you have a contract, what can you do with a legal contract? So that helped me get out of it, you know, the the un- difficulty of uncomfortableness of how do I tell Madonna the Madonna I'm gonna leave her to go do Michael and plus with two major artists like that there's eagles involved. Both of them have eagles, you know. Same thing with Shannon and Michael. Both of them have eagles who and who has the power over me uh, to pull me from the other, they got bragging rights that they can get me from the other. It was a, it's a, a positive and a, a flattering position to be in. And two, all these major artists want you that bad, but also it's a very uncomfortable, uh, uh, disheartening situation because you feel torn and like one one have your one of your arms pulling, the other one has the other arm pulling you back and forth, and it's it's like emotionally it, it hurts, it's painful because I don't want to offend either one of the artists, you know, any Michael, Madonna, or Janet. And, but I have to then I lend, I tend to go with the contract. That that's kind of my scapegoat of, of what I must do, and, because as a contract I got to be legal with it, you know. And I uh, caused a lot of problems if I left. So, but I did feel that um, it was it was unfair that they pulled on me that that much, and that they got angry with me at times, you know, um, because I couldn't leave the other situation. And they know how I already know how contracts are, but they still expected me to just because of the Eagles, to leave and go to them, each one. So it was very uncomfortable, but I, I you know, there was nothing I could really do when there's paperwork involved, you know, but I, I had to live with the, uh, the the discomfort of them being upset with me and the disappointment in me. You know, I didn't want anyone to feel disappointed in me that I didn't, um, I didn't uh, uh, come through for them. But in these kind of situations, somebody has to lose and somebody has to win. And um, so whoever had the contract and the paperwork on me, they won. But there was Eagles involved where they, the people that didn't win got offended and, and had a little bit a touch of begrudging, you know. But, um, it's still, you know, it, but it all worked out in the end. I wound up being with the legal uh, possessor and um, wound up doing the tour. And Michael wound up, like I said, wound up getting over it and called me back for the 96th history tour. And I worked with him in 96, 97, 2001 on the, the 30th anniversary special in New York at Madison Square Garden. And then for the, the final thing, and uh, this is it. You know, um, he always wanted me to be his drummer. He told me he was very dis- he told me he was very disappointed when I couldn't come when he needed me. And um, he was counting on me and was very hurt and disappointed that I didn't come. So all I could tell him is, says, Michael, I had a contract. You know, I, I, I don't know what to, to do, but I can say more, you know. And... Um, I guess in the end you could say he, he understood because he did call me back. 
Let's move on. You're, you're working well with me, Jonathan. You mentioned the 30th anniversary tour at Madison Square Garden in 2001, and I've seen clips online from from that concert celebrating his solo career. I've seen him do Billy Jean and when Usher and Chris Tucker came out on stage, and you've talked about the celebrity power at Madison Square Garden that night in other interviews. I didn't realize, though, that the S- September 11 terrorist attacks happened the next day. Can you tell me about the change in emotion from doing those amazing concerts and celebrating Michael's success and the energy of the crowd to waking up the next morning and turning on the news? Wow. It was like going going from total elation to waking up the next mon- morning in another dimension unknown in another a, a, um, a dimension you weren't aware of that could exist or would exist or should exist in America for, for most things because um, we always felt so safe over here you know we we shot the show on 30th anniversary special on the, both the 7th of September and then we shot on the, the 10th of September um, and then we we finished and we celebrated that night at a club uh, downstairs at the W hotel uh, in New York, uh, down in New York City, about 12, 15 blocks from where the, where the, the tragedy happened. Um, and I could see the smoke from my window in my room. But uh, we were ready to leave town and um, to go home, all go home at about uh, 9, 45 or 46. You know, it was about to meet in the lobby at 10 o'clock and with the limos to take us to the airport. And ours was the type of flights they were hijacking, uh, cross country flights, at least mine, is to Los Angeles. So, you know, all of a sudden we get a call and it says, stay in your rooms. There's something going on. And the guitar player came into my room knocking on the door, said, you have the TV on. And I said, yes, it's on, but I had something else on, MTV or something like that. And he said, no, Tony, what, you, what are you looking at? And then he said, kind of, he busted the door and said, you're not looking at the, what's happening down down the street? And I said, no. And he said, uh, man, somebody crashed a plane. Uh, some crazy fool crashed their plane into the World Trade Center. I said, no, that's impossible. All of that airspace around there, how could they do that? And, and so he turned a station from, grabbed my remote, turned a station for me. And, and I'm flipping through the channels. He said, where, where is it on your TV? And he said, oh, there it is. And it showed it. It was showing it. And I said, what? you got to be kidding. And the building's on, on, on smoking and everything. I said, this is crazy. All that airspace, how could they do that? And as we're talking, and he said, I don't know. He's crazy. It's crazy. It's, it's really crazy. And as he's saying that, the second plane flies in the frame of the screen and hits. And we, we both say, oh, excuse my language, oh, shit. <laughs> we say, oh, shit. Oh, shit, what's going on? That, that, that was an accident. That was on purpose. And we went immediate shock. I know I did. I couldn't even feel myself. I guess it was a state of being, people say they went into shock because I could see that I was looking around the room and at the TV, my eyes were extremely wide or open, frozen almost like, and I was in a deep breath and, I was like, oh, oh, like that kind of moment. Oh, my God, like that. And it was like I noticed something's wrong. I, I don't feel myself. I'm looking around. I'm awake, but I can't feel nothing. I don't feel myself. I just know that I'm looking around. So I guess that's a state of shock, the experience of shock people go into when they say they went shock. And, I mean, it lasted for quite some time. And my mother called, and I felt the same thing. And she's saying, come home, come home. And, um... And uh, she was worried to death, and we all were in a panic with, as to what to do. And um, it was so surreal because, like, like you said, the, the night before we had such an incredible uh, event of elation for everybody involved, and we stayed up to like 4.30 in the morning at that club downstairs celebrating, and at that club it was all the Jackson brothers and except for Michael and saying that we're going to go back on tour like the Victory Tour. We, they were telling us, uh, they said, Foot, you ready? They called me Foot. They said, Foot, you ready? We're going to go on tour. Michael just told us we're going to go like the Victory Tour. We put in the second Victory, victory Tour together. You ready? Two months. In two months, we were celebrating. Finally, around 4.30, everybody went to bed, you know, in the morning. And it was only, there was nine something when that happened. Got up to the shower and everything. And that happened. And it was, I was like, I stepped into to a portal, into another dimension of negativity, of, of danger, and negativity and uh, disaster. And it was I was just shocked all that day and scared to death because, you know, I was saying, I'm going to get home. They shut down all the airports. Everything shut down. And so I was worried how to get home and were they going to strike the buildings and other buildings and uh, what was going on. The extent of what was planned or happening was unknown all day long. We were expecting anything um, to happen, you know, just as bad or worse. And we didn't know what was at war or what was going on. So, um, 
it was like in one foot in one world of elation. And then when the moment the planes hit them buildings, it was like the other foot was dragged into another dimension of this of a disaster and, and, and the unknown. So you, you all bewildered. And um, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what to do, how to react. Because this is, this is totally the unknown for America. And we've never been attacked like that before. So I was totally bewildered. And, uh, and all the elation from the night before went away because right then I knew there was going to be no more tours. Uh, no more tour for us. That's for the, the new victory tour. So it was surreal. It was it was really crazy. Did you go with Michael Jackson to the United We Stand benefit com- concerts? Uh, the one in Washington D.C. Yeah. Yes, I was on that event when he was. Um, uh, what more can I give? It was the song uh, that he knew, song that he wrote, and he was trying to raise money for the nine eleven thing and uh, uh, situation. And I was on that, I performed with him. He had his whole band there. We performed with him. Of course, we didn't have the big, I didn't have my big rig drum kits. And I had the drums, but not the, my big rack system. We did it more scale down to make it work for, for the budget that they had planned. And they had done, put together, a, a formulated. But we were there, the whole band was there. And it was just about the, the event more than us as individuals and stardom kind of situation. We let the stars be the stars to bring in the, the funding. For the cause, and but I was there. Yes, I was part of that event. So I've got one more song. Off the time, <laughs> sorry. When, when people ask, people ask me about things I've done, people ask me about things I've done. I, I often forget that I did that. You know, <laughs> that's a very important event. I forgot all about that until you just reminded me. I got to put that back on my resume. <laughs> you got to put it in your book that you're going to bring out. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. I forgot all about that, that chapter. <laughs> so I've got one more somber question, and then we're going to pick it up for the last few. So as, as fun as it must be working in the entertainment industry, playing to big audiences, meeting fans, and working with the best of the best, there's a whole other side that the whole world gets glimpses of because it's played out in public view. I saw Lionel Rich in Melbourne a couple of months ago, and he had a moment when he paid his respects to the people he called his competitors that have lost their lives over the last decade or so. People like David Bowie, Prince, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Morris White from Earth, Wind & Fire, George Michael, Tom Petty, Glenn Fry from the Eagles, and there's probably a few more that I've forgotten. How do you personally process or or cope or justify that these amazing world-changing talents don't make it to old age? And, And some are a result of natural causes, but there are a lot that are related to, I guess, uh, that are related to drug use, whether it's prescribed or not, or just that rock and roll lifestyle that is 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 that the music industry is known for. So, how do you process the? How do you process these kind of events being on the inside? Hmm, it's, it's very complex and very interesting at the same time. As you say, some die of natural causes. And those are basically designated by the time clock God builds within each and every one of us. I think of the time clock set. Um, and it's not predestined, but it's one of the avenues of rules according to your work of your life and how you handle your life and your health and your wealth that determines what road it forks off into, um, how much you take care of yourself or whatever. Some things are just inherent and lay dormant in you, diseases, whatever. And then at whatever chosen time, chosen by who, we don't know. We can't say it's God. We can't say it's that We can't. We just don't even know. Uh, it's too deeper for the human mind to perceive and, and understand. It, it triggers at that specific time, and uh, because of whether whatever circumstances, and that caused the, the the time the time frame of your life to be completed from the beginning of your life to the end. That's the time frame I mean. Is, com- is headed toward completion. So the ones who abuse their bodies, because the body is a gift from God, let's face it. It is our vehicle, like our cars and, and stuff we used, to, we used to get from point A to B. Well, our, life, well, our bodies are our, our vehicles we were blessed with at birth to, to transcend and to, uh, to exist in this plane of existence, which we call life amongst us. And who knows what's on the other side of the of the wall of life, uh, the types of life in existence. But as we know, it, this one, this is our vehicle to be able to manipulate our lives in this world. Like any car, if you don't take care of it and maintain it properly, service it properly, and, and, and put the right fluids in it to make it function properly, change the oils or stay away from 
bad putting uh, bad things in it, it's going to deteriorate faster than it was meant to deteriorate. And some people are risk takers. Some people are adventurous and curious. So they take they experiment with drugs. The key to not becoming a drug addict, I found through my own practice, is to never, with capital letters, never try it. If you never try it, capital letters, you won't know what it's like, and you won't be subject to a bad outcome. The safest people is the one like my ones like myself who never. I'm not have no curiosity what it feels like. Bi or to be one of the gang who does it to fit in with organizations or people or a band, be one of the guys, so to speak. I have no curiosity for that. And, I mean, it's non-existent within my thinking, my, my mentality, my emotional state. Uh, so I've never tried it. So I can never get hooked. If you never try it, you can never get hooked. So, but there's people who have curiosities about things, people who also have a, a great desire to want to be long. And I never felt those things. So they try it. And once you're hooked, you're subject to the outcome that they, they come to. Um, and that's the danger of doing that. You know, I, I've i always, since born, born, I was born a little kid, I love life. I love, you know, things around me. I love manipulating creativity. I think I, I have great values in a lot of things of, of this existence of life. So I treasure them. So I treasure my life. So And then I, I love being able to and capable of having the physicalities and to treasure those things in enjoy them and create things are just existing, get placed from place to A to B. So I must take care of my car, my body, meaning my car being my body. I must take care of my vehicle so I can have the best life I can. And that's been always been my first and foremost goal is to, to do that uh, and um, be able to, to play the way I'm playing and be able to be co- totally coherent. I didn't like being I uh, just the thought of being impaired where I, I don't know what's happening around me or worse, even worse, don't know what's happening to me. It's so frightening. So I definitely don't want to be impaired in any form, way, form or fashion. I've never, I've never smoked cigarettes in my life and I've never drank alcohol in my life. Never. I've never done drugs in my life. I've never smoked weed in my life. I've never done anything. I'm the cleanest man on earth other than if, if something and, and the chemicals or the food happened to me, you know, um, but I purposely design my life and my world into like that so that I can sustain and, and be able to, to accomplish like I've been able to accomplish at full throttle uh, of my physicality and my mentality. So uh, I always have big dreams and big goals. So I needed the best vehicle to get me there. And this is my body, my, my physicality, my mentality, the clarity, clarity of mind, the clarity of focus, and uh, clarity of drive, emotional and, and, and spiritual drive. And to, to do that and have that, I have to have clear airspace in my spirit. I have to have clear airspace, no cloud of cloud in the sky, my spirit and my, my spirituality, uh, to, to take advantage of that, that positive energy that's there. So I've, all, I've designed my life to always be clean and have that clarity. And, and, uh, it's unfortunate that some, some of the ones that you name, you know, um, not naming the specific name, but we know a lot of them that you mentioned have uh, partake taken into those uh, curiosities of drugs, and, and uh, which they thought, I don't know why they were thinking it would help them in their lives. And, and there's another thing that's important is that I never felt and believed that getting high takes you away from your problems. So like a lot of people escape to that, to get away from their problems and their issues, the things they're dealing with, they, I'm going to get high and I'll forget about it all. But guess what? First of all, you wasted your money because that only lasts a certain amount of time. And as soon as you come down, your problems are sitting there right on the shelf waiting for you to have, be right there in your face, back where you started from, from the moment you got high. You're back where you started, and you still got to face them. So that's all nothing but for a few minutes or hours of, of your time in your life. And, but it also was a, became a, more of a detriment to your life in that it, it further drug you into the, to the, uh, the, the fog of... of deteriorating your body more every time you do it you go worse and worse on your body so getting high is the wrong mentality of escape escape some problems an issue so i didn't ever believe in that you know um and then uh, at the same time if you're trying to escape the, the fact that i don't have money i need money to pay my bills i'm having trouble i'm struggling but guess what you just spent the little money you had on those drugs and you made the drug dealer rich richer and you have less money for your bills so you made your situation worse 
by getting high and giving your money to the drug lords and, and, and dealers and pushers. So that didn't help you any, anything else. And then your high is over now, so you still got to face those money problems even worse. You're in a worse position of money problems. You just gave the little money you had away and to get them a better car, a better home, add another wing on their home and stuff. So there's a certain, to me, common uh, knowledge and, and awareness of all of these things. That was just natural for me to say, well, this doesn't make sense to do that and then take a risk because each one of them threw the dice when they did the drugs and they crapped out and we lost. And, and um, it was just a really sad thing that they, they, they didn't work out the way they thought. And the other thing is that nobody belongs to themselves. All of them think that it's my life. It's a favorite phrase of everybody. It's my life. I do what I want with it. It doesn't bother you. Stop, stop trying to tell me what to do. But guess what, my friend? You're wrong. Your life, my life, everybody's life belongs to the, all the people who love you and who care about you, beginning with your mother and your father, your sisters, your brothers, your uncles, your grandfathers, your, your aunts, your grandmothers, and your friends, your peers, everybody who's in your circle who cares about you and loves you. You belong to them. You have to take care of yourself because... They're invested in you through the love they have for you. So you have to take care of yourself because you, you are somebody else's property of love. You know, I don't believe that, you know, I belong to myself. I belong to everybody who's around me and who love me and care about me, even all my fans now. So I have to do a good job of taking care of myself. I don't want to wake them up one morning and, and I just I took my own life by doing taking a chance with it. Uh, that would be devastating because they'll feel the hurt and pain of it. I will no longer be around. I've escaped it all. But I left them with broken hearts, broken spirits, deteriorated states of being, you know. And is that fair to do And just because I felt like I own my own life? No, it's a misconception. We all belong to each other. Everybody belongs to the other person, that people that love you. There's people that don't even know you, that love you and care about you. Like for me, people all over the world, I don't know them personally. I never shook their hand, never hugged them, you know, never kissed them, never, never been around them. But they express love to me and love for me, you know, and appreciation for what I've done and how I made their life a little bit better by lifting their spirits through my drumming and through my music. That has extreme value to me. I feel like the richest man on earth. How can I put, throw that on a crap table and gamble it away and lose hand by doing drugs or something crazy that I didn't need to do and hurt these all these millions of people? It's so totally selfish for me to do that. Why am I to do that to, to people that care about me? I, I didn't deserve their love and their adoration and their caring if I took that kind of risk with their treasure. So there's a lot of, like I said in the beginning, lives very difficult and complex, a lot of different uh, aspects of it all. But those are some of the ones I'm, I've, I comes to mind for me in explaining myself, my own personal beliefs and feelings about it all. And even leading on from that and a bit of that question before about that, the persona that these artists have on stage compared to their life, whether it's mental health issues or whether it's something else, whether it's experimental, something that's always interested me about the music industry and even the entertainment industry is that sex, drugs and rock and roll culture that was really prevalent in the 70s and 80s. And I've heard you say you you grew up loving comics and superheroes, especially Iron Man and the Silver Surfer, and you avoided this yeah. this whole culture... Don't forget Thor. And, and Thor, good old Chris Hemsworth, our, our, our Aussie boy, that's good. <laughs> and you, 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 you avoided this sex, drugs, and rock and roll culture so you could be a form of musical superhero. Was that, yes. was, was, it, was it hard to do? I mean, like, you, you look at some of these guys, and, and even today, like a, a Keith Richards, like, what, we don't really see what he does off stage, but when he's on stage, like, it doesn't matter what he does off stage, everybody loves him when he's on stage. So there's this kind of yeah. shift that there's, they're just these crazy entertaining superstars on stage, but they can't quite get their lives together off stage. Was, was that lifestyle ever, were you ever interested in that lifestyle, performing with so many artists? Was the option out there to, to try stuff? And, I mean, you must have been around it a heap. So, so there, there oh, must yeah, have been sure. some kind of temptation or offer at, at some stage. Were you always confident in yourself to say no? I'm going to tell you straightforward, 
straight fast. It was flatlined for me. The feeling is not doesn't exist in me of curiosity or desire to be one of them. I'm too busy trying to be one of me, the only one. Um, I never had an interest in the other side of being high, you know, the euphoria they say they get. I never had a curiosity in it. I mean, literally, capital letters, literally, zero, flat line, flatter than the sidewalk you work, you walk on. There was, it doesn't exist in me. It really doesn't. It's like when I speak of it, it's like a void in my spirit. I don't feel no reaction, no tingle, no no sensation towards it. It doesn't, it's not even there. It wasn't embedded within me. I watched them live their lives that way, and I stay away from it. You only say, man, what are you doing to yourself? You know, but you don't want to say too much because then they'll kick you out of the, the circle, in the circle. So I just let them live their lives. I live my life too, but I, I, I sit there and dread and, and know what they're doing, but, you know, they feel like it's okay because they're still here. But the next time you do it, it may not be here. You know, and once again, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to me, too, because I love you and care about you. Every one of them that are lost, Michael, George, Michael, all, all of them. You know, I didn't know Whitney so much. I met her before, but I don't know her. Prince, uh, I loved him, too. I met him too many times. And they hurt me when they, when they took their lives or they, you know, they lost their lives through these things, substance abuse. It hurt me bad, really bad. Um, so I, I don't have any relationship with that uh, at all. One of the most well-known drummers today is Taylor Hawkins of the Foo Fighters. His energy levels are insane. He's always smiling, and his drums, and he, he hits the drums bloody hard. And I've seen him twice before. When you compare him, when you compare that to someone like a Ringo Starr, who's always got a, a straight back, who always sits up straight, and and obviously has a, an, uh, a similar amount of talent, but is just kind of a different personality. Where do you feel you sit in terms of energy? Because you, you are quite energetic. Do you feel like you you can match Taylor Hawkins? I think I can surpass Taylor Hawkins' energy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I got more energy. Even at 63, I got more energy than Taylor Hawkins. Fair enough. Yeah, because oh, I've seen <laughs> And we haven't really touched on your drumming <laughs> technique because other interviews have touched on that as well. I wanted to go in a different direction. But you, you're, you're known as Sugarfoot because you've got such a soft foot on, on, on the pedal. You've got symbols behind you. Like You feel like you can match Taylor Hawkins in a drum-off? Uh, I don't do drum-offs because it's not about me against somebody else. It's about me against me. So I don't do that, but you can compare the energy levels the way we hit. I thought when you say uh, he plays really hard, hits really hard. I thought you meant the volume and the power that he hits yeah. with. Yeah, I got as much. I got as much. He's quite, quite, quite a bit younger than me, but I got as much energy as he does and power, or more so. Fair enough. Now, do you... now, 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 technique is technique. You know, everybody got different technique. Some people excel at one thing, and, and uh, some people uh, and not at another. Some people excel at something else. So, some things I can do different that's unique or better that he hasn't pra- he hadn't practiced. It's call in what you practice, and some things and vice versa. He can do that I hadn't practiced before. So, um, it's always going to be that way. A trade off of that. It's called what you focus on and practice on during your development years. That's what you can do better than another person. Therefore, you know, not not having worked on the things he has worked on, of course he can do them better. Same thing with me. He worked on the things i worked on. He won't be able to do those as good as what I do because I focus on those. So it's unfair to compare that way. Yeah. Do you remember the last time you came to Australia? Yes, yes, I did. When, I do. When was that? That was on the Immortal World Tour. The Cirque du Soleil, Michael Jackson Estate Immortal World Tour. And I think... I'm trying to, don't quote me, but I'm thinking that's in 2013 or 2014. We were there. Have you got another trip planned soon? Nothing soon unless they want to bring me back for one of my shows. <laughs> and, like I was brought there in 2010 for my MJ show uh, by um, by the, uh, the music stores there, Allen Music. Right, and... Final question before we get into where people can find you and what you're doing today. A big part of my demographic comes from the pop culture crowd and that feeling of nostalgia. And I thought of this question because I read that you are you you are a comics fan. You love Thor, you love Silver Surfer, and you love Iron Man. When Adam West passed away last year, who obviously the original Batman, I was thinking about 
how I would define the term pop culture. And I came to the conclusion that it has to do with longevity. And my thought process is that the original Batman and Robin TV series was created in the 60s, and I grew up with watching it in the 90s, and it's still on TV today. And it's the same with the Beatles music as well. It's been around for 50 years or more. How would you define pop culture, and does Michael Jackson fit your definition? Absolutely, Michael Jackson is defines pop culture because he's from the 60s in his era. You know, um, uh, he's four, like I so said, four years younger than me, but his professionalism, even more so than any of those people, his professionalism began when he was under 10 years old. And, um, you know, so most, for the greatest part of his life, he was, he became pop culture and, and immediately, he became a uh, superstar icon from uh, the first song that they released, I Want You Back, and uh, and Who's Loving You was the first song, one of the first songs. And these are both of those songs and showed his, uh, his maturity and his vocal technique out of someone that's under 10 years old. And, um, so he immediately defined was defining pop culture uh, with his career. It was no slow, staggered growth uh, growing for him to become that and, and be that. He immediately became it, you know, instantaneously with that first hit song. And um, he's been the identity of pop culture since then. I, I think I believe and he's grown into something greater, I think, than uh, anybody imagined was possible with him. You know, because most people thought that once he get beyond the little boy stage, he's not unique anymore. And with that, that adult voice, a mature voice, and that he would just fit into with the rest of the uh, people of the older age. But Michael reinvented himself and became greater than anybody can imagine and became the greatest uh, pop star uh, that has ever been in, uh, in history. In fact, quite possibly the greatest star that has, has ever been, you know, um, globally. So there's not many artists that uh, saturated the, the globe as much as Michael has with his presence. You go to any continent on earth and they know and they've heard about uh, Michael Jackson. I heard that even some people that, you know, in, in the far outlying areas of, of South America, they mentioned Michael Jackson's name and they looked up because they, now, nowadays they have TV and even though the tribesmen in certain, certain uh Jungle cult, cultures now they're getting a little bit exposed to to some of the modern things and and I read somewhere where they had shown a picture of Michael Jack Jack they lit up and they said his name and people were shocked that they knew his name so um, Michael is to me there's no one going to be as as, as uh, well known or, or greater than Jesus Christ as, you know um, globally but as a, a straight human being who was anointed by God I think Michael was given that gift to be to be that, to, to, to move people in the love that he saw and he sought for the world. You know, I think he was a, a device uh, used by by the greater creator creator to be a, a messenger, a pre-messenger for the message that uh, he spoke of, which was love and togetherness and unity and forgiveness and, and, and caring about uh, each other and one another, as well as caring about our, um, our mother, the planet of the earth that we live on, which we need so greatly. So, um, he he was he's a the, the poster child for pop culture from his birth uh, on through his his tender age when his mother first heard him sing and say Joseph you need to listen to Michael and Joseph didn't believe her and then she con- she kept pushing and convinced him to take a listen to Michael he should be in the group I mean with his brother Jackson and they weren't Jackson Five then so um, when he was a little boy, he, he sat down and reluctantly, reluctantly listened to Michael and he said, oh, my God, <laughs> he's the first. He can be up front <laughs> immediately. So um, define, Michael defines pop culture from from very, very young in age and the, the, the extent of his the length of his career, professionalism and career until the day he passed. You know. Would you add any other definitions to the term pop culture apart from longevity? Would you add any other branches that add into that? Kind of that that kind of ter- that term. What else would you add to define oh, yeah, pop culture? Progressive thinking. Uh, pop of culture to me is progressive thinking, open mindedness, uh, um, light spiritedness, and and um, and, vi- and the visionary of of uh, expectation, uh, visionaries of creation. You know, uh, open and that's that's part of open mindedness. You know. Um, and I think pop, pop culture and pop music defines that. You know, music is, is different 
similar to and based upon and thread through the music of old of the 60s, 50s, and 30s and stuff, but yet and still re envision and, and open mindedness, uh, mindedness applied to it. Uh, uh, Created pop culture, you know, and pop. Not that I'm talking about in the music, but also as well as other things in clothing, you know, and and um, television programs. You said the vision of it, certain things you couldn't do in the 60s and 50s. Then and, and pop culture spread, and open mindedness uh, happened. You know, all of a sudden it was okay to do this. You know, it was a little treading water and scary to to do that on television, but gradually they broke the ground and uh, and, and started doing things that weren't were looked at uh, down upon before. Pop culture kind of opens the door, and that pop culture mindedness opens the door in a lot of things in society uh, that has happened in the last 30, 40 years, you know. And I think my one, my term that defines it is as open mindedness to opportunities and possibilities. Where can people find you, and what are you doing these days? I know you're working on, on new music. You've. You've constantly mentioned writing a new book. I hope you do. I hope you are actually considering writing a book because I'd definitely love to read it. I know you're all over social media. I found you actually on Facebook with your um, drum renditions of different Michael Jackson songs. I've been watching a few of them, and they're really cool. My dad got me into the drums a little bit, and I've played a, a tiny little bit, but I'm not very good at it yet. So it takes time. But what what else are you doing? Okay, I just launched my merchandise line, um, uh, JonathanMoffitt.store. You can go on there and look at my merchandise. I, I don't, a lot of people don't know that I started drawing, and that's why I was into Marvel Comics so much. I started drawing at four, and as you mentioned, I mentioned before, I started drumming at six. So I was actually drawing and designing at before I was drumming. So I design, have a lot of designs and, and uh, ideas and, and products that I've, I've done um, from my, my art uh, career. And my art does, um, uh, studies and stuff. So um, I design a lot of things, you know. And I got clothing, and I got I have music equipment. I got a lot of lot of different things, products, and and I just launched my T-shirt and, uh, and merch wear, as well as you know we we have my emblems and my uh, artwork on all kinds of products, phone cases, iPad cases, uh, mugs, stickers. There's gonna be posters, and um, I'm, I'm doing my eight by tens. Really um, cool eight by tens with my big setups and stuff like that. I'm selling those as well. So I'm selling a lot of products online on my new store. It just came out, and I launched my new anthem song for the Fourth of July, and uh, I'm trying to get that big launch one day. You know, hopefully it's called I, "In Our Country," and it talks about freedom and everything is about the positivity of freedom. And then I have a second song called "The United States of America," or basically "The United States of Freedom" is the name of the song. And um, and I wrote that. I write all my music, and um, and uh, I own all my music. And I have another song, third song there. And so, do you know what it means to be free? Everybody enjoy freedom, but they really don't think about the importance of freedom and what what it means to be free. So I have I have some really enlightening music, much like Michael wrote uh, with his songs that were uplifting and as well as soul searching. I have a lot of music in, in that light. So I launched those on uh, my uh, my my store on my uh, website, which is. My website is um, uh, my website is jmdb dot world www dot jmdb dot world and there's my stores on there and all I mean just look on it all kind of videos and photos and the, the uh, overview of my entire career and there's gonna be more things to launch a book I've talked to publishers in New York and we're trying to find the right publishers and, and do a book so there's a couple books in mind uh, a few books I'm gonna do a children books. Um, called Sugarfoot, and basically tell the story how a little boy can have a, a, a great dream beyond reach, seem like and beyond belief, but but live and strive and make it come true uh, through belief in oneself and hard work. Um, so I'm basically going to tell my stories in a children's book, and uh, also I'm going to have my coffee table book, which is going to be a combination of autobiography and um, and a uh, book of, of interesting facts and and uh, about my entire career and all of the work that I've done. And um, then I have a book of poetry, and, and my, I call it mindset material. Of, so people get to really know who I am through my viewpoints and I, ideologies and ideas about life and, and society and, and each other. Uh, I write down my spiritual feelings about all of those things, you know, of, of being part of humanity and about humanity and importance of us 
living together and working together and, and, and ecology and everything. So I have several books in the, pro, in the work. And social media as well. Are you, have you always been a fan of social media? Yes, since the eight, late 80s when it started coming out, internet started launching. And I was going to say I didn't have the means and the ways because I'm not as literate with all of that stuff. I'm trying to catch up with the rest of the world and the people that are very literate with it. Um, um, but I'm not as much. Uh, my, my fiance, Myra Hisami, um, she handles my social media for me. And um, she's my tech person. She's out of Silicon Valley, and uh, she handles all my my um, social media stuff and um, posts everything. And um, I, she she gets with me and, and tells me the questions that the fans ask, and I give her the answer. She posts everything, so we work hand in hand. And even on my design work, because she's a designer uh, of uh, all as well games and stuff for for the, the internet, and as well as other I, other things. So, so she's a designer, and I'm an artist, a designer. So we work very well together. Jonathan, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've loved every minute of this. I'm a big nostalgia buff, big pop culture buff. You get into those, both of those categories and you're still working today, which is which is something that, that should be admired. I admire it. I look forward to following your, your career from here on in. And I'm really looking forward to that coffee table book as well. I've got a lot of autobiographies in my collection. I'm a big fan. And it's been an absolute pre- pleasure to walk a bit down memory lane, talk a bit about the past, talk a bit about the present, and I hope you've enjoyed it as well. It's been an absolute pleasure. I had a good time. I enjoyed it myself going back, reaching. You asked some questions, like you said, that were uh, not out of the norm. So I, I enjoyed going, being challenged with those things.